All right. Are we all good? Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this talk on C Sharp 8, 9, and 10, and 11, and 12, and whatever is coming next in this amazing programming language, which is slowly turning into F Sharp. It is amazing, though, that the programming language has evolved quite a lot over the past 10 years. There's been so many changes to the language, it can be a little bit hard to keep track on what's happening with C Sharp and why you would want to use some of the new language features. But just because there's a new language feature doesn't mean that you have to use it. It's there to use for the purpose that where you might need it in your applications. So let's get through a few of those really amazing language features that will hopefully help you build really great applications. Before that, my name is Philip Eckberg. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me on Twitter afterwards. I have a free book on C Sharp that you can download as well. Just ping me afterwards if there's anything that you want to discuss in terms of C Sharp. So with that out of the way, let's talk about all the really great features of C Sharp. This here is a tag cloud of all the language features added up until, let's say, C Sharp 8. And there's really quite some of the features that were added over the years that changed the way that we build software, that changes the fundamental way of how we look at expressing ourselves. In terms of working with generics, that changed the way how we work with collections. Maybe before that was added to the language, many, many developers thought that maybe we don't need that. We can go by by using the old array list that we used in the past. And the same goes for async and await. That was added to the language quite late, but it changed the way that we consume asynchronous APIs. It changed the way that we express ourselves, and it's an addition to the language that let us build more powerful applications. And I guess that's true for all the new language features as well. They seem to add new features that help us express ourselves in ways that requires less code. But if it's used improperly, that may tend to make the applications unreadable. So with, as with any language feature, use it with caution. What's great about the development of C Sharp as a programming language is that it's open source. You can participate in the discussions around which features do you want? What's the purpose of one of these new language features? What's the, the ideas behind it and how are they going to implement that? Maybe you want to participate in talking about how you would like to see new features in the language as well. I tend to spend some time here just looking at what's coming in the next versions of the language, just to keep track on really what's happening. But one of the things that I learned from the early on when they did this, when they open sourced C Sharp, is that even if they talk about new language features being added to the language, unless it's actually shipped, there's no guarantee that it will make it into the next version. So you might read a lot about features that might be coming in C Sharp 11 and 12, but until they actually ship that version of the compiler together with a runtime, don't just expect that that's going to make it into the language. And we'll talk about one of those features in just a moment. That's been cut out, cut out of the language. So what's happened over the years? I have some highlights from C Sharp 7 that's fundamental to what's happening in the new versions of C Sharp. And one of the really big changes they made in C Sharp 7 is changing the way that we look at, at tuples or tuples, depending on where you're from. We really talk about the same, same thing. So in the early days, we had this type in C Sharp that allowed us to work with this container of multiple different values. But as of C Sharp 7, this became a first class citizen. So now we can just define this, this tuple in line like this here, and it's a first class citizen in the language. It's a really small change, but it's one of the fundamental things that helped us then get other really great features into the language in terms of pattern matching and deconstruction and working with, with containers of data. So with this introduced into the language, it also meant that we can now look at how types can be deconstructed and turn into something that looks like tuples, which is where this new concept of adding a method to any given type in your applications called deconstruct. As long as you have a method called deconstruct and you have a few out parameters, that means that you can take this object and pull it apart in different ways. So if I have this on a person class, for instance, that would mean that I can take an instance of my person and deconstruct that into two new local variables. Looks very much like a tuple, but it isn't. This here is in fact declaring two local variables and I can then use them in my context. And again, this is something which is in its own, maybe not very useful, but when it comes to combining this with 
the concept of pattern matching and writing more expressive code, this is becoming really interesting to work with. Another example to, with, where this is used together with tuples and, and deconstructions is if we have this concept of the right-hand side is declaring a tuple, and I'm then deconstructing that into two new, new local variables. I can then use this in my context as the properly named types. And again, that might not seem very useful, but when it comes to deconstructing an actual type that declares exactly what this contains, we could then deconstruct, deconstruct that object. And this is all done by just introducing this method on your type. You can have multiple different deconstruct methods on your type, and that would allow you to pull that object apart. And the reason you want to do this is because then you can look at the exact thing that you deconstruct an object to when it comes to pattern matching, which was in its turn introduced in C-sharp 7 as well. Pattern matching, we'll get into that as well, but it's a way for us to look at an object and how that is expressed and what it contains and what the attributes are of that object. And while that was introduced in C-sharp 7, it was kind of a, a first, first attempt at just making that into language and making people aware of how to use patterns and pattern matching. So with two of these highlights out of the way in C-sharp 7, there's many more features that was introduced in this language version, but these are the ones that we need to keep in mind to fully understand some of the, the rest of the work that has gone into the compiler. So if we talk about C-sharp 8 and kind of what's beyond that, which is the purpose of this talk, there's been a lot of changes in the language. They've introduced a lot of language features. And if we just look at the list of features that they've added, we can start off by talking about the read-only members. And there's default interface implementations. I'll show an example of this soon, but it's, this is kind of a divider of, of either you love it or you hate it, which isn't really true for many language features. I personally don't like it, but we'll talk about that soon. They did some pattern matching enhancements. I'm not gonna talk about all of these here, but the highlighted ones are the ones that I wanna talk about. We have pattern matching enhancements. Really, it's the, I would say this is the pattern matching 1.0 because it made it really purposeful in the language. We've got something called nullable reference types and asynchronous streams. Those three features, that's what we're gonna be focusing on for a little while here before we go on to the next version of C-sharp. So as you see here, like as of, as of C sharp 8, which is the eight, eighth is iteration of the language, there's still a lot of features being added to the language. Some of them are improvements to what was already added before, but some of them are really new concepts as well. And what I like about the additions to C sharp is that the language team looks at earlier or other versions of other programming languages and take inspiration from F sharp, Kotlin, Swift, and they even talk to the other language designers on those teams to get inspiration of what do we want to add to the language. And when it makes the cut to C-sharp, they also need to make sure that it feels like a C-sharp language version or a C-sharp feature. Um, so it doesn't feel like it's an, a Kotlin version of a language feature just added into the language. It needs to feel like it's a, a feature built for C-sharp developers. So if I want to use all of these new things in C-sharp, how do I go about that? A change that I've also made is that some of the newer versions of the language require you to jump on a new runtime. And that means if you want to use C-sharp 8, 9, and 10, you have to use the corresponding .NET runtime. Now, given that we have .NET Framework before and now .NET Core and then .NET, .NET again, it can be a little bit confusing which one you want to use. If you want to use C-sharp 8, you have to do Visual Studio 2019 or later and .NET Core 3.0, and for .NET 5, it's, it's C Sharp 9, and so forth. So every version or every uh, long-term support version of the runtime will have a corresponding C Sharp language version with features added. And the reason the, the, they're doing this is because they can now also make changes to how things work in the runtime. They can add language features that depend on runtime changes as well. And I guess that's not really a problem anymore. Back in the, in the day when you had to update your .NET framework on a physical server, that was a little bit more of a risk doing that. But nowadays, when you just deploy a new Docker container with a new version of .NET, and if that doesn't work, you just fall back, there's really not a risk anymore just upgrading your .NET runtime. At least not as much as in the past. So given that we have to work with .NET Core or .NET 5 or 6 and onwards, it also means that they had to update the the templates for WPF and WinForms. 
So we can create WPF apps and WinForms applications or Xamarin or Maui versions that are able to target .NET Core and later. So that means that pretty much every version of, of C Sharp can now be used in the different types of projects. Now I did mention that there's one language feature that they introduced that I don't particularly like. So if we create one of these new projects and I decide to use this new thing called default interface implementations, that means that I can now add implementation details to my, to my interface. So look here, this is an interface and then I have an implementation of that. While I'm using an, an expression body member here, I'm still, I still have implementation details about what happens when I call this method. That means that whoever implements this interface don't have to implement this method themselves, which can be a little bit weird, right? Because it means that the interface now has logic on it, which we, didn't, we weren't able to do that in the past. The only difference between this and multiple inheritance is that we don't have the actual instance to work with. This is great for library developers that want to introduce breaking changes or update their libraries without breaking everyone. There's very few things that are more annoying than updating a NuGet package and you're required to implement like 10 different interfaces or additional methods on an interface. So this is a great option for that. But it also means that if there's already an implementation, the compiler won't tell you that you have to implement that method. So you wouldn't know that there's a new method available on the interface that you just updated, which can be a little bit problematic. Now, if we're targeting multiple different types of applications and multiple different types of runtimes, this might not be available. So if we're using a shared library like I'm doing here, it's going to tell me that the target runtime that you're now compiling for doesn't support default, implement, default interface implementations. So while you can still write the actual code here and it, the compiler tells you that if you're targeting, let's say, .NET Framework with the same .NET standard library, it will tell you that you can't compile for that particular target. But you can still use that language feature in a shared library and compile it for the particular platform that, that it works on. So as I said earlier, this here is kind of a, a divider. Like either you love this or you really hate it. But for library developers, it's a great language feature. All right, so probably one of my favorite language features added for a very long time is something called nullable reference types. Now, I take it that most of you have had a null reference exception in the past. Anyone that hasn't had a null reference exception, <laughs> you are lying. <laughs> because that never happens, right? You're going to get a null reference exception. Unless it's maybe your first day as a developer, like then I totally accept that you haven't had this, but maybe tomorrow. So, what do we do if we cannot go back in time and fix the mistake of adding nulls in the language? Like adding a null or making it easy to add null in C Sharp is really a design flaw. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a language designer, but I can still appreciate that it is a, a fault to the language. Making it easy to add that to the language is, or in your applications is really not good. So what do we do? We add support in the language to let us know when there is a potential problem. And this is where nullable reference types come into play. Now the naming here is, in my opinion, not very good because it, nullable, reference types has always been nullable. So what does this actually mean? They gave it this name because we had nullable value types, which means that you can add a little question mark to your value types and all of a sudden you, there are now reference types and you can set them to null. But since reference types has always been able to be null, this should really be called non-nullable reference types because that's what's gonna happen. So let's go and have a look at what that looks like in just a moment. We're all familiar with this problem here, right? If you haven't seen this, it's just a matter of time. But really, why did we get a null reference exception in, in some of these applications? Obviously, we, we can't go in and, and check all of these problems, but what's the problem with nullability except or, or despite of the fact that it, it costs a lot of money to fix. The problem is that we, we're gonna make our code harder to read. We're gonna have null checks everywhere. And, and writing code just for the purpose of there might be a problem that I haven't designed my application for, I don't particularly like that. It would be much better if I had to explicitly determine when could something be null? When could this potentially be a problem? When is it my intent that this could be null. 
But when something can be null, what does that actually mean? It's pretty ambiguous, right? Because if I return null from an, a method call, did something happen? Was there a problem? I expected maybe a result coming back from a database, and if that returns null, does it mean the, the record didn't exist? Does it mean that there was a problem in my, my, my particular method? Who knows? It's an ambiguous thing, right? So we want to be very explicit about what null actually means. And it also encourages mutability, and that means we can have issues with when it comes to multi-threaded applications or asynchronous programming. <laughs> So really, all of this is telling us that we want to avoid nulls in the, in the language and or in our applications. We want to go ahead and use something else. But we also want to get the help of C Sharp as a programming language to tell us when there might be a problem. Because we want to avoid this here. So obviously, this here checks if, if my object is null. It then checks a property and then another property on that. We can simplify this by using the null conditional operator or we can use pattern matching. We can write this in like, as many people there are in this room, we can probably express this in a different manner. The solution to this is to enable a nullable context. We can do this by using a compiler directive, or we can do this on the project level. If I do this, it's going to change the way the compiler looks at all my reference types. What happens is that all reference types are now assumed to have a value. If they don't, the compiler is going to give us a warning. And there's very much help in the language that are going to tell us if there is something that could potentially cause a problem. It sounds awesome. It sounds like it's going to fix all of our problems. But of course, I'm going to show you how we break this later. So what it does is that, in this case here, I have my string here. Very simple example. String name is equal to null. And right off the bat, you can see here that it's this a little squiggly here, and that is now indicating that we have a warning. It's warning me that you should probably not set this to null, because the compiler is now looking at the string here as something that should never be set to null. It's even telling us here that name here could potentially be null, so calling dot split here will most likely cause a problem. So how did this fix anything? Well, it didn't, but we, at least we found a place where it could potentially be an issue. So how about we jump into Visual Studio and just look at an application, and I'm going to enable nullable reference types. Font size good in the back? Perfect. So if we go into the project file, you'll see here that I can enable something called nullable. And if I do that, it's going to change the way the compiler looks at the application. If we just comment that out again and just look at the application, if we look at these two classes, there's nothing in here that looks odd. There's nothing in here that looks out of the way or out of the ordinary. But as soon as I enable this, this, um, this nullable context and just save this here and go back, Hopefully, it's going to give us some squigglies here to tell us that, well, details here should probably contain a value. So to get rid of this here, we need to ensure that both my property details and the first name and the last name, that they're all set to a value. To get rid of this warning, we could simply say that I really allow this to be null, and all of a sudden the warning just disappeared. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should have question marks all over the place just to get rid of all the warnings. Instead, there's an alternative approach. So what we can do, let's do this for, let's do it for the person or the details down here at the bottom. I'm going to introduce a constructor. And if I do that, and if I can scroll down, here we go, the warnings disappeared from first name and last name. And that's really great, but they're now giving me a warning on the constructor instead and telling me that you have two properties that are marked as not being allowed to be null and you should probably set them to a value. I could add them to, to my constructor and let's say last name. And I could set first name and last name to the corresponding first name. Come on. Writing and talking at the same time, always very easy. Here we go. And last name. So of course, now I don't have a problem here anymore. 
But the issue with this is that I've now changed the contract. So every, anyone in the application that is now using this class, they're now required to instantiate this with these two, uh, with these two, these two um, constructor parameters. And that's not very good, because now I probably have a lot more issues in the application. And honestly, null wouldn't be a problem in this case here. There are many ways that we can approach this. As I, as I said earlier, as many developers that there are in here, we can approach this in different ways. But changing the contract, we could probably agree that, sure, this is a great approach if it's the first version of the, the code base. It's a new application that we are coding. But if this is a five-year-old application that we are updating, it's probably not a good idea to just go in and change all your, your classes. Because you're gonna have a lot of compiler errors. And honestly, in here, the problem with nullability or being null was probably not first name, last name, and details. So in this case, I'm going to allow these to be null. Now, of course, I have three question marks here, but at least we got rid of the warnings. So what did this change? Now, anyone that's using these different properties will now be warned that you should probably go ahead and do a null check. Let me zoom out here just a little bit. Here we go. So now, since I'm accessing details here, the compiler doesn't know that this could potentially be set to an instance. So this here would be causing a null reference exception if we have just a new instance of this, this class. Or if we, if we didn't have an instance of the class, it would, this would cause a problem. Again, there are multiple ways to solve this. We could say that, well, if, if details is null, don't go ahead and get the first name, and we've, we've fix that problem. So now we're not going to get a null reference exception. But of course, is that if that was an input parameter to another method, this, would, this expression would yield null and we could have more problems. You see where I'm getting at? We have to really think about the architecture and how we approach this. But at least the compiler told us that if you're not sure that this is null checked, you're going to have a problem. We could also do, we could call argument null exception, throw if null, and pass in person dot details, and all of a sudden, the uh, the warning disappeared. This is because there's something called the the attributes for null state static analysis, which is quite a mouthful to say. So what it does is that it knows that I've performed a null check. It knows that if this throws an exception, it's properly done a null check. So that's why the warning disappeared here. But now I've explicitly said that this is going to throw an exception because I don't expect this to ever be null. If that happens, it's going to tell whoever's consuming this that we had a problem, and they can go ahead and handle that. So we fixed this method here, but I know that there's still another warning. This is not really a good idea, right? Returning null here is quite ambiguous. So what I can do to get rid of this warning, like I can't add a question mark here because I guess that doesn't make any sense. But what I can do, I can promise the compiler that this isn't null and there's no warning. <laughs> but again, I guess this is not the best approach. <laughs> so what I wanna do is that I wanna, I really wanna fix this problem. Using the, the exclamation mark to solve this is just for cases where you really know better than the compiler which is never. So try not to use the, the exclamation mark. Instead, we are going to fix this by creating a new instance of a person. You can do var person is equal to new person. And I'll, I'll show you a pretty cool language feature called target type new expression. So if I don't want to um, explicitly say that this is a new details, I could instead say that this is a, just a new and it will just automatically figure out which type it is, which in this case, well, just writing out details wouldn't make, like wouldn't use very many characters, but if this was a very complex generic type, being able to just use a shorthand would be really nice. I could say first, first name is Philip. Can't even spell my own name. I'm just gonna bother with last name. And then I can do yield return person. This is a pretty cool hack. So whenever you have an I enumerable of person or I enumerable of T, you don't have to explicitly declare a new list or you don't have to use an, a temporary array or anything like that. You can use a yield keyword to create an iterator. So pretty cool shorthand way of, of approaching this here. 
So now we've fixed all the null reference exception in the application, right? And we learned that if we, if we really have a null, we can use the exclamation mark to just force this to, um, to work. Now there's one more setting that we can change, which is treat warnings as errors. If I uncomment this here, and let's just do varp or do person is equal to p is equal to null. Again, I can't even spell. Look here what's going to happen now. It's going to give me a compiler warning because we're not allowed to set this to null anymore. Now, all the warnings in the application are going to be treated as non-nullable. All the reference types are going to be treated as non-nullable. And as long as there's a warning, it's going to give us a, an error instead. So this is a good idea if you know that you don't have many warnings in the application. I mostly don't look at the warnings tab because there's too many. So treating them as errors is probably not the best approach for me personally. But I know that many projects or many larger organizations like to keep the warnings at a minimum. Make sure that everything is done explicitly because a warning is there for a reason. So what you want to do here is that you just want to go ahead and fix the problems. And again, I guess if we have an exclamation mark here and just promise that this isn't null, um, that is going to just get rid, get rid of that compiler warning. All right. So this is a very good option. You can do this in the project settings as well. The same goes for turning on the nullable context. You can do that inside each project. It's a per project setting. And actually, what I didn't show you, I forgot, you can enable and disable this with a compiler directive. So you can say nullable, disable, if you really don't want to go ahead and fix that particular method at this time. It might be that this method is too complex to sort out. Or you look at it the other way around. If you just disable the nullable, nullable reference types for the entire project, you can enable this for one method at a time which will help you slowly refactor parts of the application. I guess that this is the, the second best thing that we can get if we can't go back in time, because we can't go back and just remove nulls from the language completely. Right, so this is pretty much my favorite feature from C-sharp 8. Actually, I, I love this feature as well. Asynchronous streams is also one of those things that is going to make our lives a little bit easier. I really like asynchronous programming, and if you've seen any of my courses on Pluralsight, you know that I, I've done quite a bit of courses on asynchronous programming, and it's because it's one of those things that let us express ourselves in a way that was really hard before async and await and task, and, and all of that was introduced in the language. So being able to stream data asynchronously, retrieve items in a, a way that really is fluent to read and easy to understand, I think that's a really great addition to the language. It all comes down to this pattern here. So again, we have this, we have this method here where you have an async keyword. If, you have, if you've ever used asynchronous programming in c -sharp before, you know that the async keyword is, is most of the time it's paired with a ta task-like object. Now in this case here, I have something called an I async enumerable of a string. What this means here is that it's going to give me strings streaming strings into my application. And it's going to give me each item asynchronously, right? So each item is going to be retrieved maybe from a file on disk. Maybe it's going to give me this from a database or an API. We don't know. So this here indicates that the data will be streamed, right? And how do we stream something back? Well, we introduce what I just showed you, the yield keyword. So the yield keyword will tell the iterator that there's now an item to be processed. And we only use the yield keyword once we've in fact retrieved some data. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to use read line async, just read one line at a time from a file on my disk. And then I'm going to await that to just do this asynchronously. And then I have, I have this, this fake task.delay to just simulate that this is done from a web call or something like that. If I ran this code on an old machine, like my, my, when I was a kid, uh, which used those spinning hard drives, this would have, I wouldn't have needed that task to deal it because everything took so much time. But nowadays with all the fast SSDs and fast computers, I really have to fake the delay to, to show exactly how this works. So this here is producing a stream of data. 
But what's important to know as well, as with any I enumerables, it doesn't really start iterating through the data unless you consume it. And you consume this together with the for each keyword, right? So to do this, we have a wait for each, and we retrieve each element from that uh, method. Let me show you how this works. So I've created, oh, I'm using Visual Studio Code now, just to spice it up a little bit. I have this, this, this to produce a stream, I've introduced an async I enumerable of string called get lyrics. And what it's, it's going to do here is that it's also using one of the new language features called a using declaration. Notice how it doesn't open and close the using declaration. That's because it's going to make sure that it's disposed of when this method completes. And this method is going to stream data back to whoever consumes this stream of data. So this using block won't, or this using statement won't dispose until all of that is done, right? And then we have this while await stream dot reline async is a string line. So this here, I'm combining the await keyword with a pattern matching to check that whatever this returns, it needs to be an instance of a string, and I'm going to capture that into a local variable that's only available in this, for, in this, in this while loop. And then I'm going to have a task of delay and then yield return. Now this here is going to, to stream this data back to whoever consumed the, consumes this stream of data. So to do that, I'm going to say await for each of our line in get lyrics. Copy that. And oh, this here is the new top level statements introduced in C Sharp 9. It means that you don't have to use the public static void main stuff anymore. It makes it much more streamlined to produce your applications or produce your program files, which is nice for something called minimal APIs. If we have some time over, I can show you that as well. So now this here is a little bit different. The await keyword is in, in front of the for each. Now normally, if you use the async and await keywords and task, the task parallel library, you would have had the await keyword in front of the method call. That would mean that it would wait for that entire chunk of data to be completed. But what this means now, if we move it to the front, means that for each element that we are going to get, that is going to be retrieved asynchronously. So I can do console.write line, and I'll print the line like this here. And now it's going to stream this to my console. Let's do this, .NET run. Hopefully, each item is now streamed into the console while this is compiled and executed. Or maybe it just doesn't work. Look at that. It works. World's best song. <laughs> Perfect. Now. So for sure, this is a little bit different. Now there's one thing I want to tell you here, which is kind of true for all I enumerables. You never really know how much data is going to be inside of it. So whenever you do, for instance, two array, how would it know when to stop? How would it know when to finish producing this array of data? We don't know if this here is a, is this a database call or if this is a file that's just filled with text as we read it, right? So, Never do two array or two list on your enumerables unless you know that it's, it's filled with data. That's a little bit tip. All right. So now we're going to be talking about C Sharp 9. We've actually looked at a few features from both C Sharp 9 and 10 um, in this demo as well. But I'd like to talk about something called record types, which is one of the features that was the the idea behind bringing C Sharp and VB as open source and rebuilding the compilers, one of the first projects they wanted to do with this or the first language features they wanted to introduce was at the time called primary constructors, which really is what record types are all about. It took quite a long time to get this language feature done and get it to a state where it makes sense for everyone. There were some trade-offs that they had to make. Now, this here provides a concise syntax of defining your your types or your reference types, it can also, as of C Sharp 10, be used with structs. What it also does is that it comes with a lot of built-in functionality out of the box. It provides value-based equality. It allows you to print the object and all its properties as a string in a very nice, nice format. 
what also came with C Sharp 9, when you can't do records, records are immutable as well, and I'll show you an example of that. But what they also introduce is something called init-only setters. So let me just bring this over here. Let's see here. Here we go. I didn't show you this, but what we have is on, if we look at the details, there's this, this little thing here called init. That means that once you've set this to a value using the object initializer, you cannot change this anymore. So it's like you set it once and then it's set forever until you create a new instance and copy the value. So that was introduced in C-sharp 9 as well and called init-only setters. And we just looked at what's called top-level statements. That's the idea behind just allowing you to just write code in your program.cs. Why would you have to write all the boilerplate stuff inside your program? That doesn't really make sense. And it's, it's not only meant for new developers to easily get into C-sharp. But as I mentioned, it's also one of those things that makes it easy for us to write very minimal applications that might be deployed as a small Docker container. It's very self-contained in a small, very small file. We also got really pattern matching enhancement. There's a lot of changes to pattern matching and pattern matching is one of those things that's being changed. I, I would say that with every version of C-sharp coming forward, there's going to be changes to pattern matching. And we're gonna spend some time showing you all the patterns that have been added. We looked at the target type new expression as well, which is a nice addition to C-sharp. Uh, it, it removes the idea of just having to explicitly de define the type when you create an instance. And there's a lot more added to the language. Again, like this here is, is quite a lot of features to add to one iteration of the language. And I just want to emphasize that you don't have to use all of this. You don't have to understand all the language features. But if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like, is there a smarter way to solve my particular problem or express myself in a different way? There might be a new language feature that allows you to do that and also give you some, some nice code generated out of the box that's probably more, more fault safe than what you could potentially write yourself. So I've mentioned pattern matching quite a lot and we haven't discussed exactly what this entails or what that means to the language. Pattern matching as a concept is really simple. It's the idea of being able to determine what certain things are. Is it a yellow fruit? Is it a banana? Is it a puzzle piece that looks in this particular way? Is it an Ikea poster that's extremely incorrect? It actually looks like the furniture that I tend to build myself. But So we can use pattern matching to determine those different things. It's not all, only for determining the color, but it, it's, it's for so much more. We can use it to drill down into an object and determine exactly what it contains, what it inherits from, and so forth. But matching on a given type and the attributes, I have the attributes in quotes here because it's not the attributes that you put on your, your methods or on your classes, it's the attributes in terms of what is this, right? So in C Sharp 1 through 6, the way that you would build this is, is that you would get the type and compare that to whatever you're looking for. Then you would check the property of that given type. And if you have to use this as the concrete type, you would have to cast this yourself. There's nothing wrong with this piece of code here. It's just a little bit more code than, we have, than what we have to write. So as of C Sharp 7, they introduced a way for us to use a switch, the switch statement to determine sort of this, the same thing, but in a little bit more of a concise manner. Well, I wouldn't say concise because it's a lot more code, but you get the idea, right? <laughs> we can express ourselves in a similar way, but what we don't have here, there, there's no casting involved here. We don't have to cast this particular type into the concrete type before we use this inside the, uh, inside the case here. So it's a little bit different. So personally, as of C-sharp 7, I wouldn't really use this because it didn't make my code much more readable. But then something called switch expressions was introduced. This is a new way of looking at, at an object. So here we say, I want to get a result based off what this, this object is. And we can create patterns to determine that. So we have the, the input here could be anything. And I want to create a switch block that contains a lot of expressions. The expressions will then, or the patterns, will then determine what this is. To make it simple, we could say that 
If the fruit here is an apple, I'm going to return the string, this is an apple. And for everything else, this here is a discard. The discard will in fact match on nulls as well. It will match on anything that is not of that particular type. They don't even have to share the same base type when it comes to pattern matching. If you have an object passed into the method that's using the type object, it could match on anything. It could match on strings, ints, and whatnot. So this here looks a little bit more tidy, right? And this here is what, what's returned. So we're gonna be spending some time looking at different ways of writing patterns because it's much more powerful than just returning strings like this here. So in C Sharp, there are multiple different patterns. And as I mentioned there, they are adding much more to this as well. What we just saw here was a type pattern. It matches the particular type that we're looking for. We have something called a positional pattern, which uses the deconstruct method. Imagine that I deconstruct an object and I know that the first parameter is the first name, the second one is the last name. I could say, find all the people in this list of, of people that have the last name of Ekberg, for instance, which is my last name. It would then be able to match that because it could be deconstructed. That's the positional pattern. We can look at different properties to determine what they contain. We can match on tuples or tuples. We can use a relational pattern. Imagine that I could say, give me all the people inside this array here that are between the age 20 and 40. Right? That's where the conjunctive and and disjunctive or patterns come into play as well. Because then I could say, give me everyone from, from the age of 20 to 40 or the people that are in this other age range. And I can use something called parenthesized pattern and I can negate patterns using a not pattern and I can use recursive patterns. Recursive patterns, simply put, means that we're combining multiple patterns together. For instance, give me a person that is also this age. Let's have a look at a few of these different patterns. So, pattern matching alone, there's a lot of patterns available in C-sharp, but we're gonna look at a few of them. I'm going to just add a new project just to show you the new project template again, I'll add a new console application. I'm gonna choose .NET 6, doesn't matter, but we can do .NET 6. And this here is now the new project template available in, in, in .NET 6, C Sharp, C Sharp 9. What this allows us to do is, is write some very nice code without having to introduce um, all of that boilerplate code that we had before. I'm going to bring in a file here called test results. This is not COVID test results. This here is like for a university or something like that. So if you're like me, you, you kind of had to take the test multiple times to pass, especially if it's math. That's not really my thing. So th therefore I have a property called number of tests. If it was a valid or if it was a passed test, say that, which date that was tested on. This is a very just simple, simple object just to represent some data and give you an idea of what we can do with pattern matching. Then I have this deconstruct method, which deconstructs this object. It takes a test result and it allows you to give you how many days ago did you take this test and was this a, a valid or a passed test. And as you see here, when you build this deconstruct method, it doesn't have to correspond exactly with the properties or fields that you have on your class. We can build this, uh, we, we, can, we can do computation in here to determine, um, for, for in this case, how many days since we took the test. So, if we have an instance, let's say that we have a test result, we are now going to assume that we got this out of a method call. Test result. It's using the base, base test result because I also have a negative and a positive test result. Should be passed or failed. Um, could also be passed or failed, sorry. So if I just instantiate this with a new positive test, of course, in this case here, I know that it's positive, but we could, again, imagine that this came out of a method call. I can use pattern matching in multiple different ways. I could say that if the test result, if the test result is positive, I could then enter this if block here. So I don't have to use this with the switch or the switch expression. I can use this with that as well here. I could say that if this test result is not positive, right, so I can negate that type pattern. Using the not in front of all the patterns that you have on the right-hand side means that it will negate that entire thing. 
it doesn't just negate the first part of the pattern, it negates everything you have to the right hand side. That's very important to keep in mind. Now obviously it would be better to just swip, uh, swap that around. I don't really want to see you doing like if it's not false, because that doesn't make any sense. So again, you can abuse the language features, but you shouldn't. Um, but what I can do here is that I can say if it's positive, and then to do check a property, I can say if the number of tests, actually let's remove not, if the number of tests are more than, than say more than, than two, then I want to enter this, this if block here. But as we don't know if this here is in fact, like I, I'd have to, in this case, I'd have to cast the, let's do this just to show you exactly, or result is equal to test result. I'd have to do this, right, to be able to access the properties that are only available on the particular, on that particular uh, type, as the concrete type. But what I can do with pattern matching is that I can use something called a var pattern or declaration pattern, sorry, to say that I want to capture this. Once you've validated all the patterns, I can then capture this as a local variable called positive, and I can now access all the properties that are available on this actual type. And if I zoom in here, you'll see that it's in fact the type positive. So it casts that for me automatically. This won't work for every different case when it cannot determine, like if you're using an or pattern to say if this is positive or negative, it wouldn't know exactly what that would be at compile time. Then you would have to cast it yourself. Again, I can then combine these different patterns by using and or ors. Again, it's a mouthful to say that. So I could say if it's positive, maybe this is hard to read, but let's see here. And let's do it on one line, sorry and it's uh, less than five, less than or equal to five. I can say that when this is positive and it's between two and five. So I could use this with ifs, I could use it with the, with the switch expression as well. I'll show you a few more patterns as well. So I, I mentioned that the test result here introduces something called this deconstruct, and I wanna use that now to write a pattern that matches this particular test result. To show you an example of, of how to write unreadable code, what you should avoid. So let's say that we want to, want to figure out the outcome of this, of this test result. So I could say, based on the test result, we're going to create a switch expression. And when I cannot determine what this is, I'm going to say that this is in con not available. <laughs> I can't even spell inconclusive, so I'm not gonna attempt that. Now, this works like a normal switch block. So if I try to add something after the disk card, it's going to tell me that it's already been, pa already been matched on. So you have to use the, the more granular ones at the top. So since discard is a catch all, you'd have to, to move this one, one line above. I can catch all the positive ones, or I can also say that when this here can be deconstructed into something that where I don't care about the first parameter, but the second one needs to be, let's say, false. Whatever this is. So this here, how would we know what that is? Like, I have no idea if, surely enough, when I write the code, it makes sense because I look at the deconstruct method, I write my patterns, but then tomorrow when I go back to this code, I'm not gonna have any idea at all what this means. So you can use name parameters as well. You could say is valid because that's what that, that is called. The, as you'll see here, it's called is valid in the deconstruct. It uses the deconstruct to pull that object apart. And then I can say for every test that is, that is not valid. And again, I could negate that to find all the ones that are positive. Avoid that, please. So now. Invalid. And again, if I don't want to use the deconstruct, because it can get hard to read. If you have to use the deconstruct, or if you want to do that, the same goes for the tuple pattern. They look the same way. You should try to use name parameters, because otherwise it won't make any sense at all. I could also combine this. Like, I don't have to use the deconstruct for all of these different ones. I could say that if it's a positive test, where the number of tests are the same that we had earlier, 
the number of tests are more than or equal to two and less than or equal to five, I can capture that as well and I can do something with that value. Again, it doesn't have to return a string, it could also con construct a complex type as well. So as you'll see here, you can combine the different types of pattern matching or the different types of patterns available. You will probably find yourself using the, this type pattern together with the property pattern the most. Or if you have a tuple, use the tuple pattern, which looks exactly like this here. Okay. Let's go ahead. So for C-sharp 10, oh, sorry, let's go through this. So for C-sharp 10, they made sure that we can use record structs, which is, I'm gonna show you records at the, as the last thing that we, we go through. The record structs allows us to also use the same syntax for producing value, value types that are records, which comes with the record type or all the record stuff out of the box. In honest, honestly, one of, like, one of the most important things in C-sharp 10 is probably the global using directives and the file scope namespace declarations. That means that you no longer have to you no longer have to declare your namespace and, and wrap everything like we do here um, in a namespace. So I can say that this here is now going to be a part of the namespace, namespace, ndc. And now this entire file is going to be inside the namespace of ndc. Instead of having to wrap this entire class inside this, this namespace, it's just a matter of indenting your code, making it easier, I guess, when reading this in, through different types of tooling. And you can also say that if you want to, you can introduce a file or you can do it anywhere in the application, but you can use something called global using directives. So you could say that I want to be using NDC for instance, but I can also say that this here is a global using to say that everything inside, doesn't make any sense here, but gives you an idea of this here. We could say that Everywhere in the application, you no longer have to introduce the using statement for NDC. It's just automatically going to be used inside the entire application. It can be confusing because what happens if you bring in extension methods, for example? You'll have no idea where they're coming from. So again, just keep in mind that some of these language features, you should use them with caution. All right, so that's uh, the global using statements and file scope namespace declarations. They also make, made it easier to do some property pattern for, for further down, like they were extended property pattern. So if we were looking at, for example, the test result and that had a, a property was also an in, an, a reference type that had a property that you wanted to check on, you can just do, um, you can just check the property using the dot accessor, I'll show you. Let's get rid of this here. Let's say that we had a, a property on here. Let's say that, that the is valid was a reference type. In the past, you'd have to do something like this here, which wasn't very nice. You could say that is valid dot uh, object had a certain value, right? Would make it much more, more, more flexible. So being cautious of time, I want to show you the final thing, which is a really great feature, and that's the record types. Record types. Let's say that I want to create a new class called person, which has a first name and a last name. When I did this here now, what happens is that this here behind the scenes introduces a new reference type. It, it creates or it generates a class, a class that has a deconstruct method on it based on the different the different properties that I defined here. It has two properties with backing fields generated. It has value-based equality, which means that if I create an instance of this, new person, whoops, new person. This will require me to enter my first name and my last name like this here. This, pos this is called a positional record. So when I have this, this primary constructor is what it's called, it requires me to pass those, those different fields. I could add a body to my record to introduce more things, more properties, more constructors, more methods, more whatever you want. The purpose of a record is to hold data. It's for replacing DTOs and making it easy to compare data. But the place where you cannot use it is with entity framework because entity framework relies on reference type equality. And as I mentioned, 
uh, record type to use value-based equality. And my last name is Ekberg. Here we go. So, what does that mean to be value-based equality? Let's say that I have two instances. I have Philip and Philip 2. They're both references or new instances like this here. Normally, if we compare to reference types, this would yield false. But when it comes to record types, this will compare the properties of those generated classes. So this here would in fact yield true. Of course, if I change one of the, one of the, one of the properties or one of the values, this is going to be false, which kind of makes sense. What I can also do here, if I don't want to do this, this entire new person, if I just want to copy this here and create a new instance, as I mentioned, it's, it's immutable, which means that I couldn't say, let's say that I want to change my last name to, to something else, or I want to change my, I want to create my wife's, an instance of my wife here. Now, instead of having to, to create that new instance, I can use a language feature called the with expression. So instead of having to create this all of that code, I could say, or Sophie is equal to Philip uh, with a first name of, right? And this here will now create a copy of all the values that are on my instance and create this, this separate instance here as well. Because I couldn't change the name if I wanted to because all the properties are read only. And I can prove that to you by going over to a place called sharplab.io, if that still works. Here we go. So I've entered the same code here. This little thing here is in the way, but I promise it's, it's the same thing. It's the record of person with a first name and last name. And the right-hand side here is all the code that's generated when I, I enter this code here. Let me scroll down just a little bit here. We have a class here. You see here, class person. It implements I equatable of person. The interface gives us a value-based equality. It then has two backing fields that are read only, means that we can only set them once. It has properties that are exposing these backing fields, which means that we can access them just as, and, and they're marked as init, which means that they can be changed with that with expression. It then, if we scroll down a little bit here, we have the operator overloads as well for inequality, for equality, and this will compare all the backing fields with each other. I'm just going to scroll over to one of them and show you. First name backing field is equals to the other person's backing field. So there's quite a lot of code coming into this here by just writing record person. So I would recommend that you use this for everything that's a data transmission or you have something that's going over the wire, you have some really simple data containers in the application, but don't use it for entity framework because that's not going to work. I do expect that they're going to make some changes with that um, later on. All right. Um, let's see here. They've also made some other changes to C-sharp 10, not as much as in terms of C-sharp 8, 9, and so forth. And the same really goes for C-sharp 11. But we've looked at quite a few of the features that are coming in C-sharp 10. And one of them that they were adding, which is a preview feature in C-sharp 10, that's also a concept they're trying to do in, in versions of C-sharp coming up, it's adding preview features. You can enable the preview flag in both the runtime and as well as the language. This here is static abstract members in interfaces. So I can change this static T instance here to become abstract, right? And then that requires that whoever implements the interface also implements that, that method. But this here is a .NET preview, .NET 6 preview feature. And it's going to be a part of C Sharp 11. Right, so if we don't do that, it's going to tell us that we, if we're not implementing it, it's going to give us a warning. Another cool feature they're doing is that we can now use constant strings in, in, in using string interpolation. It's a nice addition. We couldn't do this previously. And the natural type of the lambda, which is this called here, so we have to explicitly, in C-sharp 9, we have to explicitly determine what is this, this lambda going to be compiled to. We have to say, well, this is a funk of string and int, but the compiler could probably figure this out by looking at the input parameters and what it returns. So that's what they introduced here, the natural type of the lambda. And this here, is not, you cannot figure that out in C-sharp 10. And with that, we also got something called attributes on lambdas. 
And this here is a uh, minimal API. I have this in a program.cs file, and it just spawns up a website for me. List is for this slash ID path, allows me to pass in data which is get from, from some of the headers. So I have about seven seconds left. So what's next? <laughs> We've already talked about the fact that whatever comes in C Sharp 11 might not even really get into the language. But they're looking at more patterns. How do we match lists? How do we use slices of a list and look at that? How can we use something called a span pattern? They're doing something called name of parameters. They're going to be now finally caching delegates. So if you have a um, static method group, it's no longer going to have you have to create an instance of that and, and do allocations. Even if it's just for very high performance applications where you would notice this, still a nice addition. They're introducing something called required or required properties, which means that we could say that when you create an instance of this using the object initializer, you are now required to set this value, right? Again, we're working towards a, a way of immutability and where we force people to correspond to what our types should be. They're introducing something called raw string literals. Static members and interfaces is going to be added now as a real feature, which they've added as a preview feature in C Sharp 10. This is cool, UTF-8 string literals. I can take my string name here and just map that into a span of bytes. So I don't have to manually cast that into an UTF-8 string. This is really handy if you have a lot of data that comes over networking. Generic attributes are also part of the C Sharp 11 promised feature list. And then they've actually removed one of the features that, that they've been previewing for quite some time. They wanted to add double bangs, bang bang, on input parameters to methods. And if that was null, it threw an exception. And a lot of people didn't like this. So they listened and they removed the feature. So if you've been hoping for whatever, what this was called parameter null checking, if you really wanted that, I'm sorry to say that they've removed that. But again, this language is being worked on in the open. So it means that you can give input on things that you want and don't want. If you liked my stuff, go ahead and check out my courses on Pluralsight. I have a lot of content on C Sharp and I think I'm out of time. So with that being said, I hope you like this. I hope you like C Sharp. Don't forget to vote on your way out. If you have any questions, ping me on Twitter. I'm Philip Eckberg. Thank you so much. <laughs>